Hey guys, happy new year. Thanks for joining us this weekend for Fountain City Online. Um, first off, we just want to give you a couple of announcements before we get into the word today. Uh, the first thing up is 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been together over the past several weeks, all in one large gathering, but we have been in community hubs. Um, so we haven't gotten the information out about this uh, appropriately. But as a community, every year we start off the year with 21 days of fasting and prayer. And sometimes we start that on the first and sometimes on the third, depending on how things fall. Uh, this year we decided to go ahead with the first, um, but what we want to do is individually and collectively encourage our community to consecrate their year. That just means to set it apart as holy. And the way that we do that is we spend the first 21 days focusing our attention and our affection on the Lord by fasting and prayer. Now if you haven't ever fasted before, there are many different kinds of fasting, but at the core of fasting, biblical fasting is um, actually doing away with food for a set period of time and taking in water for the sake of, um, of ignoring the flesh in order to focus on the spirit. God uh, strengthening our spirits over just our flesh. And I don't know about you, but there's no quicker way for me to focus on the weariness and the frailty of my flesh than ignoring a couple of meals in a row. Suddenly I'm very aware of how strong my flesh is and my own desires are. And so many people will do a full fast these first three weeks, but some of you, um, me included at this point, are doing a Daniel fast, which means that we are, I'm stepping away from meat, sweets, and wheat, from anything processed. I just kind of do fruits and vegetables um, through this first three weeks of, of the year. And that's a way for me to focus, to deny my flesh and to focus my attention on God increasing in me. Uh, and so if you want to get involved, we would love to invite you to take part in that. Do it as a community hub. Uh, you may even adjust how you cook together on Sundays or what you bring on Sundays so that it fits into this Daniel Fast motif. Or if you're doing a full fast, obviously you don't have to cook anything. Uh, but we want to encourage you to take part in some way. If you have questions about that, uh, you can email info at fountaincity.org and we will give you answers on how to participate in fasting depending on what your needs are. Uh, and so we want to encourage you toward that. Now every night of that period, the 1st through the 21st, we're partnering up with Harvest House of Prayer and Take the City uh, to do nights of prayer and worship. And so from 6 to 7.30 every single night through the 21st, there's going to be times of prayer and worship. And so we want to encourage you to take part in that. If you're looking for opportunities just to focus your heart and your mind around Jesus in 2021, that is a great way to get started. Uh, and they are looking for people to participate and to lead in these intercessory prayer times. And so if you'd like to sign up for a prayer slot, you can do that by going to bit.ly forward slash TTC 21. You'll see that link right here. Uh, and you can go there and get some more information and just jump in on what it looks like to lead in prayer. Uh, secondly, after our 21 days of fasting and prayer, uh, we also encourage you to start a Bible reading plan in the new year. For many of you, maybe you have never read the Bible all the way through. And so what we teach, what we preach on Sundays is always coming rooted from the scriptures. Uh, and it's really important if you're going to be a Christ follower. One of the primary ways to grow in Jesus and to intimately know him is to read the Bible. Uh, and so we want to encourage you, we have Bible reading plans available. You can read through the whole Bible or the New Testament and the Psalms. Um, we have both of those available at fountaincity.org forward slash Bible. Uh, so take uh, an opportunity, go check that out and get involved where you can with that. Several of us will be starting Bible reading plans together and holding each other accountable. That's another great way to start that practice. Um, thirdly, this coming week, we're starting up all of our men's and women's groups again. So men's meetings on Monday mornings at 7 a.m. at the Ministry House. Uh, women's meetings on Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock. Uh, we would love to encourage, encourage you to get involved there. If you have any questions, email info at fountaincity.org. Uh, and last but not least, um, on Thursdays, the first and the third Thursday, this is good, this is helpful, First and third Thursday, every single month, we're going to be doing um, a gathering for our kids who are six and older uh, while we're in community hubs. We want to make sure that there are connection points for our children to come together, uh, to also receive teaching, to have fun times together, to build community, to have activities. And so Anna Gilpin is going to be leading that time for us on Thursday evenings, the first and the third Thursday of the month. Um, we'll be doing those at the ministry house um, on the church property, 1514 12th Avenue. 
Uh, that'll be at six o'clock. We would love to have you take part in that. If you have any questions, uh, please email info at fountaincity.org and we'll get you the details for that. Thanks for tuning in and listening to these announcements. And now for a word from our sponsors. What? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs>
I got struck by lightning. I was, I was blown away. And seeing her energy and her vitality and the way that she interacted with people, she was so confident and life-giving and fun. Uh, and I was just blown away by her. And I met her that night, and her name was Chrissy Carter. Now, many of you know her as Chrissy Collins now, but she was Chrissy Carter then and always in my heart, a little bit of that Chrissy Carter. Uh, and she just has this beautiful personality and life-giving um, uh, attitude about her. And so I was blown away by her. And I spent the next several years just kind of like waiting to see how the Lord was working in her life. And then when we finally started to date, my life was forever changed. I started out blown away by her. I have lived blown away by her ever since. And as much as Chrissy Carter Collins has changed and transformed my life, she doesn't hold a candle to what Jesus has done in me. And, and for many of us, like we have to know that the most transformational thing that will ever happen to us is meeting Jesus, right? And as we move into this new year, I want us to begin by just looking back and remembering when and how Jesus changed our lives. And maybe for some of you, as we look back and we remember these transformational stories of how Jesus has shaped us and changed us, I pray for some of you who haven't had those moments that this will spark an encounter with the living God in your life. And here's why this is so important for us in 2021. Because as we've kind of looked back and seen all of the bad news, as we've gotten 50,000 political ads in our mailboxes over the past 12 uh, minutes, <laughs> as my phone is probably filling up with text messages right now about the runoff, here in this new year, Jesus is still good news. He doesn't just come to speak good news. Jesus is the good news of the kingdom of God. And we want to rebuild our foundation on the person and the work of Jesus, not just in the world, not just in the Bible 2,000 years ago, but in our lives today so that people can look on our lives and see the goodness of God at work. And so I want to introduce you to a man today found in the book of Mark, who had just such an encounter. Uh, so turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15, verse 21. Um, this is one single verse, and I think it's going to be powerful for us to look at. Mark 15, 21. It says, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, who was the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him, while Jesus is on his way up to Golgotha, carrying his own cross, they forced Simon to carry the cross of Jesus. There it is, one single verse, and in this verse we see Simon's life condensed into what may seem meaningless to us, but if we dig a little deeper, we see that the nature uh, and the, the power of what actually transpired that day and the power that it has in our own lives. Now, in Jewish custom, when a person's name is mentioned, especially a person of importance, is often followed by the name of that person's father and the name of that person's father and the name of that person's father and so forth and so on. It was a culture that was built on pedigree and heritage. And so it was never just here is Grant. It was always here is Grant, the son of Richard, the son of Linwood, and they would continue to go. And the reason that this was so important uh, is because they built everything on this idea of your history informing your presence and your future. For them, it was everything in the past actually tells us who we are and who we are becoming. And so your family of origin and your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, that told us who, what your vocation would be. That told us who you were going to marry. That told us what your habits and strengths and weaknesses were going to be. That told us everything about you. Uh, and the philosophy behind that was really this, that where you come from determines who you're going to be and where you're going. Now, that's a scary enterprise for us. Like in our culture, we have been fed a steady diet of you get to be whoever you want to be and do whatever you want to do, right? You even hear some of the language now uh, where kind of the more modern families kind of poke at postmodernism and talk about us being snowflakes. Like we all have to be really perfect and great and unique and beautiful, uh, and in this culture, in Judaism, they would have done the same thing. They would say, no, you're not an individual. You're actually a collection of your family's histories. And so a person was introduced as the son or the daughter of whomever. In fact, if you look in the, uh, the, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, you actually see these, these lineages, these genealogies, where the writers of those Gospels are telling about where Jesus came from. 
And both of them have a specific purpose. One of them connects him to David because they're saying he is the coming king, the Messiah. And the other one connects him all the way back to Adam. They're saying he is the second Adam. He is God redoing creation with sin no longer involved. Beautiful, right? But here in the story, we see that a person is always introduced as the son or the daughter of whomever, and they can't ever really escape their past. It's like every time your name is mentioned, someone sees your entire family history and they sum up who you are based on where you came from. You can imagine. Because it's no big deal. Like I've got a great father, Grant, son of Richard. Like I'm really proud of my dad. I'm proud of, proud of where I've come from. But what if my dad was terrible, right? Dad's watching that this morning. This, he, he's listening to me say this. Dad, what if you were terrible? What if you were a murderer, What if you had done some serious criminal activity? And every time somebody says Grant Collins, what they hear is Grant, son of Richard, that criminal, that murderer, that so-and-so, right? And so your name is always tethered to this like shady past. It's always seedy and gross and dark. And you can't ever stand in the fullness of who you are by yourself because you're always linked up to some story that was broken and despairing. And, and I think that some of you may actually know that feeling. That for some of you, you like live to outrun who you once were or where you came from. For some of you, you came from um, maybe rural area and you moved to the city because you really want to like outlive some ways of thinking and patterns of life. Or for some of you, you grew up in houses that were broken, where divorce was common or abuse. Or maybe you came out of an addictive pattern like We have stories around us and in our own family lines where we're trying to outrun and outlive some lineage and history that came before us. And maybe you feel marked or destined to just repeat whatever broken patterns and cycles came before you. But we see this hopeful message in the story of Simon, right? And and here we see that strangely when, when Simon comes around, he's just On a trip in from the country, like this is the most random story. It doesn't even tell us a lot about him. It just says that he's got this chance encounter and he ends up carrying the cross of Jesus. Now, I don't want to like overshoot the the beauty of this moment. Can you imagine if you were just on a road trip and you got stopped in traffic in the middle of a city and you got out to look to see what's going on and a crowd just kind of like hustles you up into it. There's this bustling crowd and suddenly you find yourself at the front of this crowd, you've kind of been forced and pushed forward into the middle of this thing. And all of a sudden you are front and center for the action in front of you. Um, I I made the poor mistake one time of going to a hardcore concert with some friends. I got pushed into the mosh pit and just destroyed. I think it was at a blindside concert or something. I, I don't know if you've ever been pushed into the middle of something you just didn't want to be in, but that's where Simon is. He, He is forced into the middle of this crowd and all of a sudden he sees Jesus beaten and bruised and he is bloodied. He's broken. He has been hit with sticks on his head. His beard has been ripped out. He has been whipped. He's a bloody mess. And he can't bear the weight of the cross on his shoulder anymore as he is going to his death. And so the Roman soldiers look around and what seems like chance or random, suddenly a finger lands on you. And they choose you to get up under the weight of this cross covered in the blood of the Messiah, and suddenly you are bearing the weight of this cross. This chance encounter where Simon comes into contact with Jesus. And and we don't have a lot of details. My my mind wants more detail, right? I I wanna know if they shared some glance or if they spoke. We don't know if they exchanged words. We don't know if Simon fully understood in that moment who Jesus was. But what we do know is that he met Jesus. What we do know is that he encountered the power and the love of the Son of God in action. And this encounter so shaped who he was that his history isn't even mentioned. It's as though the writer is saying that his past no longer matters. It no longer has importance. In a Jewish culture and tradition where your past and your history is of complete importance. He's saying no, not now. This guy Simon has had this encounter that has has turned and shaped and changed everything. And now everything that was in the past is different. Not only does his past no longer matter, but Mark actually goes the distance of saying uh, that this isn't just about Simon. 
he goes on to explain that Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, now listen to that. In, in a culture and tradition where you only look back and talked about where you came from, now he's looking forward and talking about who comes from you, about what's going to happen as a result of your life. The focal point of Simon's life is no longer where he came from and what mistakes he may have made in the past or what his daddy's name or sins were. The new focal point is where he is going in his future. And this is good news. It was this encounter with Jesus that was the catalyst for Simon of Cyrene's life to no longer look back, but to look forward. And this is a profound promise for us. Because when we are in Christ, God doesn't come to us and just polish up our old existence so that we can look back and kind of think on things with better memories or a better mind frame. God actually comes and he makes us new creations. And for some of you this morning, this invitation to be a part of church or to be a part of the family of God, it is not an invitation for you to put on just religious activity. It is an invitation to be a new creation in Christ. This is the work of God that he comes and he makes us new. And if you know Jesus, if you're sitting around a table this morning and you have experienced his power and his grace in your life, then you have a story to tell. Can you imagine Simon leaving that day? Can you imagine the encounter he had with Jesus and like how he probably couldn't help but to share that with his wife and his family and his, his boys? Can you imagine that he's sharing that story with them? And, and it's important to say that they talk about their names with such familiarity in this moment that there's not a lot more examples. It's almost as though the early church, the Gospels are referencing people they know who are walking with them. So Simon goes home and he is sharing this, this gospel, this good news about Jesus who takes away the sin of the world with his little boys, Alexander and Rufus. And this is the promise for all of us. That when we encounter the power and the love of Jesus, he makes us new. He washes our sins away. He, he takes my sins, though they are scarlet, he makes them white as, as snow. Right? He removes my sin from my life as far as the east is from the West. And I think this is really powerful for all of us. And we, and we all have a Jesus story if we're in Christ. You know, I was uh, reflecting on some of this with Roman this past week, that we all have a Jesus story. I remember for me, I remember going through college and I had known Jesus since the time I was a little boy. I was five years old. And I remember those moments when I felt so deeply called to the work of being a part of the church and being a part of what God was doing. But through the years, I really didn't understand grace. I understood work and effort and duty, but that only like contributed to this idea of legalism and that I was going to earn my way to God through my good works. Guys, that is Judaism. That is Islam. That is, that is every religious system that I would just earn my way to God through being good enough. And then somewhere in college, I was faced with the reality that I was still a slave to sin. I was still broken under the power of sin. And what I had known in, in, uh, partially in the past, suddenly God made incredibly clear to me that it was by grace alone that I've been saved, through faith in Christ alone. There is no other way that I was being saved. And this grace came to me in the form of love poured out from me through the person of Jesus. And it wasn't anything I could do. I couldn't add to it or take away from it. It was his love that broke through all of my legalism, all of my pharisaical heart and my self-righteousness. And he actually turned it on its head. And he showed me that it was him doing the work. And then it was him that was going to sustain the work. And Jesus broke in and he changed my life. I remember being re-baptized, uh, coming on a staff here in Columbus. Um, I, I got re-baptized because I just remembered how much God had brought me through and that he was baptizing me into his grace. That as a kid, I was baptized. And I'm, this is not like a theology of baptism, okay? So please don't take it as that. I just knew for me, there was an experience where the Lord had taken me to a place I had not been and he was bringing me under his influence in a way that I had not experienced in the past. It was a baptism of his, his love and his spirit in my life. His grace had taken over and I was new. And I remember when I was standing in a group of people in a worship auditorium um, in school, that same kind of time period in my life. I remember working so hard and feeling like 
God just didn't see me. Like everything that could go wrong was going wrong. I was working two jobs. My car seemed to break every single time I thought I had some money in the bank. None of you know what that's like, I'm sure. And man, I was standing in this auditorium with a bunch of people who were experiencing the power and presence of God. And I was, I was lonely and I was depressed and I was so angry. And I remember saying for months and months and months, and I've got, you know, middle child syndrome, like it was deep in there. God, you don't even see me. Nobody sees me. It was just this woe is me thing inside of me, you know. And I'm standing in this auditorium and I'm saying it. God, you don't even see me. Like, I don't feel your presence or your nearness. Everybody's experiencing you, experiencing you. And I just feel like I've got a mouthful of dust and a heart that is hard as a piece of coal. And I remember that night, the minister was at the front of the auditorium. And he said, if you're not experiencing the power of God, we want you to come forward. And I'm Pentecostal. So I was like, okay, I'm doing this. This is my moment step to the front. And guys, it's not all about feeling, but listen, I needed to feel God's presence that night. Step to the front and everybody's praying. And I somehow felt worse. You know, like I I felt like it added insult to injury because now God wasn't present. I wasn't hearing his voice and a bunch of people knew about it and were praying for me. And I still was just not experiencing his nearness. And then I went back to where I came from and I was, I was broken. I was in the back of the room And I was just saying, God, you don't see me. And I remember as clear as day, this big guy who later became a mentor of mine, he walked by and I I didn't know him. I didn't know his name. He didn't know mine. He walked by and he put his big burly hand on my shoulder. And he said, "Uh, God just told me to tell you that he sees you. God, it was like I'd been sniped from heaven. You know, Jesus with a word directly to the organ that needed it. My heart, he sniped me. He hit me dead in the heart. With the precise words I've been thinking, the the very thing I've been saying, God, you don't see me. And he said, I see you. I, I can't help but to tell that Jesus story to other people because I have encountered this grace. I, I can't see things the same way. I can't live the same way. I've got nothing but gratitude and a big fat thank you for the rest of my life to give to Jesus because of how he loves me, what he has done for me. And how about you? You have a Jesus story. You know, 2 Corinthians tells us that when when that stuff happens, when I've had these encounters with grace and with his nearness, it says that we are new creations. Like I said, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. He says, so from now on, we don't regard anyone from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ like that, we don't do it any longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. It says the new creation has come, the old has gone. And the new is here. Listen to that. On the the heels of 2020, pressing into 2021, the old is gone and the new is here. The new year is an incredible reminder for us that we are not a people who are looped into the past, but we live forward with hope and expectation about the goodness of God. We're stepping into 2021 and God wants to make new creations in 2021. God is doing new things in 2021. And Paul writes that you and I are this new creation. And and I want you to grab a hold of that. Maybe for some of you today, you are wrestling with the guilt and the shame of some activity or action that you saw in yourself in this past year or past month or past week or two hours ago. And what I want you to hear is that the grace and the mercy of Jesus is present to erase any shameful thing from the past and to make you new. He wants to make us new. He wants to set us free. And Jesus doesn't just make us new. And like, that's the end of the story. Like what a lousy gospel it would be if you just get saved and then you hold on for heaven one day. Or you just get baptized in the spirit one time. It's an experience you had, but then you live like hell the rest of your life. Like that's that's not a gospel. Jesus doesn't invite us into the finish line of salvation. In salvation, he actually invites us to, to start over. To begin again. That's why he. That's why Luke compares Jesus to Adam. He is saying, this is a brand new thing. We're starting the story over. Everything that sin and the enemy took from you, God restores. And he says, now get moving. Get to work. Get back to living in this year in a way that I have called you to live. We don't exist on old experiences. I can't exist on my salvation from when I was five or even my baptism when I was 21, 
or those moments in college when I was 19 and 20. I can't exist on those. Now, those are stories that feed my soul, but I I can't live there. God's moving forward, and he's inviting you to move forward, right? There is nothing that God can't do. There is nothing that he can't heal or forgive or cleanse or overcome because God is in the business of making all things new. He's a resurrection God. He takes dead things and he breathes life into them. And the same God who raised you to new life five and 10 and 20 years ago or five and 10 months ago, he is actively involved in your life today and he is inviting you forward to continue in faith in 2021. So maybe you've fallen in 2020. Seriously, maybe you fell back into some old ways of thinking or patterns of life. Maybe you just got really egocentric and life became about you and your pain or your situation. Man, I want to invite you that it is time to get up and dust yourself off. Dust off the stuff of the past and look forward. Maybe your faith got shallow and weak in this past year. Maybe you just didn't thrive, right? There was a lot of circumstances that just caused people to not thrive, Friends, it's time to stir up your faith and fight to move forward because God, God is in the business of making us new. No longer looking back, looking forward. Maybe in this past year, you just kind of fell away from uh, those, those places of strength for you. Maybe you stopped reading your Bible or praying with consistency, intentionality. Maybe you lost contact with your community, with people who you know are your family that love you, people of faith who encourage you. Guys, there's mercy Dust yourself off, repent, confess, and get moving again. We we serve the God of the impossible. We serve the God of the brand new thing. And so I want to encourage you as we step into this new year to cultivate a life of Jesus stories, to cultivate a reminder about who God is and what he can do, and step into some new things that create space for God uh, to grow in your life and for you to grow in God. Right? We, We talked about it earlier, but there are 21 days of fasting and prayer. Maybe that seems really big and audacious to you, but step in and participate somehow. Take a step. Why don't you take a week and fast and pray and just see what happens. Uh, Every year we see these miraculous answers to prayer when people partner with the Spirit during the season of fasting and prayer. Um, Bible reading plans. For some of you, it's really difficult to stay with it in the Scriptures. Agreed. I'm with you, man. Uh, I I think anybody in our church would tell you that this is a discipline. It's something you actually have to grow into, right? And and it's a way that we come to know Jesus in a deeper way. So if I can just encourage you, whatever fell away in the past, now is the time to hit reset, and to start over, begin again. You and I are called to uncover the Jesus stories in our lives and to share them with as many people as we can. There's something powerful that happens when you share your testimony. It actually generates faith in your life and in others' lives. When I hear the stories of friends around me who God is showing up for them in a special way, it gives me faith to believe that he's going to show up and answer in my life in the same way. It reminds me that God is able and he's present and he loves me. And so what is your Jesus story? What is it that God wants to cultivate a reminder about in you? How can you call those things to mind And remember to stop looking back, to stop blaming, to stop holding on to things from the past and to look forward. You know, for most of you, you've had these encounters. Um, You know Jesus. You know that he's changed you and he's shaped you and formed you. You aren't who you once were. And you know that it's only by his grace and his mercy that it's happened. But for some of you today, you, you haven't ever really had that encounter. And I'm not just talking about a feeling or just an experience, but a revelation that Jesus is true, that he is the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that he wants to make your life new. And today, Jesus is offering you a new beginning, a life that's defined by his grace and his mercy and love. And he's calling you to stop looking back, to stop being defined by your past and by where you came from, and to look forward, understanding that the blood of Jesus makes you new, and he wants to give you a new start. Friends, today, I want us to learn how to tell our Jesus stories. And so even next week, we're going to just have people sharing their Jesus stories as our message. We want to share the testimonies in our community. We want to build faith in what God can do through what he has done. So learn to tell your Jesus story. 
Practice your story in community hubs today as you're in homes. Tell your story to somebody else. How did Jesus change your life? It doesn't mean that you got to be a perfect example right now. It just invites people in that you're, you're a person in process and Jesus is at work in you. Don't go silent about Jesus. So what has he done for you? What has Jesus done for you? You know, Jesus invites all of us to come and to follow him, to encounter the love that makes all things new. The one final thing I just want to state is that in Simon's story, it's an incredible reminder for me that when Simon has to take hold of the cross of Jesus, whatever else he's holding on to, right? Like groceries, luggage, baggage from his past, he has to let go of that stuff to carry the cross. And Jesus calls you and I to follow him in the same fashion. And he says, if you want to be my disciples, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. But you can't do that and hold on to everything else. And for many of us, we live our lives tethered to old stuff, unforgiveness, or brokenness, or addiction, or broken relationships. We hold on to um, hurt and heartache over 2020 and financial burdens or things that just didn't work out the way that we thought. And we cling to those things. And sometimes the very things that we cling to are separating us from the life that's in God. But if we're going to carry the cross of Jesus, if we're going to follow Jesus and be where he is, it demands that we let go of some things that are holding us back and holding on to us. Today, Jesus is offering his hand to you. He's inviting you to come and to be a part of his work and his life and his kingdom. But you got to let go in order to hold on to him. What's your Jesus story? Who are you going to tell? And what do you need to let go of in order to take hold of Jesus. We'll let you guys discuss in Community Hubs today. But thanks for joining with us. And if you're not in our community, we love you. If you need anything, reach out to us. God bless you guys. I'll talk to you later.